be bouncing around a little bit, but my main text is going to be coming out of Luke chapter 8. If you want to turn there and put your finger, uh, I want to talk to you this morning about something I think is very, very important for us as Christians. Our faith. When people ask you this question, do you believe? What do you think? What do you say? Uh, scripture, of course, talks about faith a, a bunch, uh, but I want to share some, some scriptures with you that, that, that specifically pertain to faith. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing. That is hearing the good news about Christ. Hearing, hearing. Are your ears open to hear this morning? Are your ears tuned into where God wants you to be this morning to receive the good news of Christ? Are your ears open? Hebrews eleven six says this, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who, sin who sincerely seek him. Uh, they must believe. Do you believe this morning? Do you believe this morning? Romans 5, 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into the place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently, say confidently, confidently. and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. I don't know about you, but I need a little confidence in my life today. Do you need confidence in your life today? Are you a confident person when it comes to your relationship with Christ? Because I think faith is a paramount thing, and our confidence has to grow within us. We have to know that we know that we know who we are to know where we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to be doing. If you don't have a, a positive image of who you are in Christ this morning, we're praying, I've been praying, that you will leave this place today knowing that you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus, and through faith you can accomplish greater things than you ever thought possible in your own strength, in your own mind, in your own being. Because God wants us to do something new. He wants us to go further than, than, than we currently are, but we can't get there. Listen to me. We can't get there if we continue to see ourselves as less than. Ouch and amen. You can say it. We can't continue to see ourselves as being lacking. Because if we have Christ and if we have faith, doesn't Scripture say if you have faith as, as, as big as a, a mustard uh, seed, right, that you can say to a mountain, move, and it will move? That's the type of faith we're talking about this morning. The faith that says no matter what, the circumstance, no matter where I am today and what's going on around me, that I believe that God can do what he said he'll do. And he'll do it again and again and again because he loves me and he's for me and he wants nothing but the best for me. Why do we walk through life thinking that God wants to punish us? Why do we constantly think that bad things are happening to us because, and, and you hear it, you know, people are like, you know, God's just, you know, not hearing my prayer. God's not answering my prayer. No, God isn't, answer, God isn't absent. He's just being silent. And he's working in the background, but we can't see past our own circumstance. Where is your faith? Where is your faith? So these three verses speak these three words. Hearing, believing, and being confident. God's trying to paint us a picture through Scripture that faith will help us to grow and to live a, an abundant and a full life. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of living less than. I'm ready to live in the plus side of things. Uh, I was watching this uh, sermon this morning. A guy whipped out jumper cables, right? And he talked about, you know, sometimes our hearts need a, a jump start. And God had, pulls out the jumper cables, and he connects them to himself, and he touches our heart with them, and automatically sparks start to fly. Sometimes we need to recharge ourselves. And it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen through just being positive. It happens through being positive about the scripture, about being positive about who God says that he is, understanding who he wants you to be and living in the promise of that. Hmm. I have a question for you this morning. If faith is the answer to this question, here's the question. How badly do you want it? How badly do you want it? How hard are you pursuing after it? Are you willing to give up 
things in your life, relationships, circumstances? Are you willing to put them down so that you can move into that place that God wants you to be? How badly, how badly do you want it? Are you willing to sacrifice? That's not a word we love to hear. Are you willing to sacrifice your dreams and your desires, the things that you love, the things that you hold in high esteem for the things that God wants you to have? Because the things that I want in my life aren't always the things that God wants me to have. And I look to those things as being goals and achievements. And I want to I reach this pinnacle. And God says, I want you right here. And it's hard for me. I'm human. You're human. It's hard for us to say, God, I'm willing to sacrifice my wants and my desires and my needs so that I can receive what I need from you so that I can live in the abundance that you've provided. That's hard. It's hard to know. But I love what, what's been being preached, and I love the message of our worship this morning that we are in breakthrough. But your breakthrough is going to cause you to have to break some things in you. Ouch. Ouch. You can say it, ouch. Are you in, are you in Luke chapter 8? We're going to be going to the 40th verse. I want to, I want to, I want to share with you two pictures of, of, of healing because of faith. And I, I want to share this story because, first of all, it's just a, a beautiful picture of, of Jesus. But also, it speaks volumes as to where we need to be in our, in our, in our, in our life with God and our search for faith. And it says this in verse 40. On the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. And I could stop here and we could preach a whole message on this verse uh, because we need, to be, we need to be expecting Jesus, but we're going we're gonna to do that later. That will be some other time. Uh, but on the other side, there's always anticipation. Uh, but it says in verse 4, in verse 41, Then a man named Jairus, or Jairus, or however you say that, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him, to come home with him. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. So we find Jesus being met by this man who is the leader of the local synagogue. He's a pretty big dude. He's a pretty important guy, right? And what does he do? He knows that Jesus can heal his daughter, right? So he comes and he presents himself not to Jesus in his stature, but he presents himself to Jesus at Jesus' feet. He humbles himself before Jesus. He understands where the true power comes from. Because being in, re being in leadership and being in responsibility isn't, a f a, a, isn't the truest form of power. Who we serve is where the power comes from. He's the one with the jumper cables, right? He's the one that has the power. And Jairus, he understood this. So when he approached Jesus, he didn't approach him from a place of, look at me, I'm the synagogue leader. No, he said, Jesus... I need you because I am less than. You can heal my daughter. I know you can. So it says here in the next verse that as Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. A woman in the crowd had been suffering for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. And it says in verse 44, coming up behind him, Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. And the Bible says here that immediately her issue, her condition, her bleeding stopped. Immediately. It didn't take 20 years. It says immediately the bleeding stopped. Immediately her problem was made whole. Immediately. But in verse 45, Jesus says these words, Who touched me? Who touched me? Who touched me? Of course, everyone denied it. And even Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against us. It's, it's all around us. Think, think of the, the biggest crowd you've ever been in. It should be Covenant Church, but think of the biggest crowd you've ever been in. Have you been to a football game, a baseball game? We're, we're getting ready to go to Winter Jam in February. That's a big crowd. Take a bunch of kids and try to walk through Winter Jam, and you'll lose your mind because you're afraid you're going to lose a kid. It's packed, elbow to elbow. You're just like cattle moving. It's, you're not swinging your arms. It's not time to strut. It's time to be like, don't step on me. 
They were in this crowd, and people were, people were excited to see Jesus. Remember, we, we read that in verse 40, that they were expecting of Jesus. And they're all around him. And they're all around the disciples. And the disciples' job in this moment was to protect Jesus, right? They didn't just walk around and, and, and serve Jesus. They served him in the capacity that they were his bodyguards. Think about that for a second, that they were crowd control for Jesus. They were the ones that were like, hold up, hold up. Don't touch, don't do it, don't you, don't touch him. They were the bodyguards for Jesus. And Jesus feels this, this touch. He, it, it says that she touched the hem of the fringe of his robe. I don't know about you, but I think I could walk beside you right now and touch the fringe of your garment. You would never know that I touched you, right? The action of touching his robe wasn't the transaction of what happened from Jesus to this lady. The the desire to press through this crowd, her faith. I believe that she probably struggled to get close to Jesus. It says that she come up behind him. I'm sure she had to fight through some people. She probably had to get down low and crawl through some legs and, and, be, and be, thank you, Lord. But think about this woman. It says that she struggled with this for 12 years. Can you imagine 12 years of your life being afflicted. 12 years of your life spending every cent that you had on doctors, on the next thing. Being shameful of, of your condition. Because believe it or not, this bleeding condition that she had was not a, a thing that was well received by the people. It was shameful. There was something wrong with this woman. In the eyes of people, she was unclean. She shouldn't have even been in this, this crowd. But I, I was thinking about her, her, her issue for 12 years and the shame that she must have worn around on herself. Closed off from everybody that she could have ever loved. Isolated from the very thing that she desired most to be whole. To have relationship, to have fellowship. To, to be shown compassion and love. She didn't approach Jesus like the first man. She didn't say, Jesus, I know that you can do this. I believe. Touch me and, and heal me. She snuck in to that inner circle. She creeped through that crowd to the point that she could touch the hem of his garment, the fringe of his robe. Why is that important? Because, here's why it's important, because... She wasn't reaching out out of the abundance of a boisterous faith. She had faith that will move a mountain. She didn't approach Jesus like the first man because her faith was a little bit different. But she was still made whole, right? Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. As soon as she touched Jesus, she was made whole. And he says this in verse 45, who touched me? Everyone denied it, and Peter said, Master, the whole crowd is pressing up against you. But in verse 46, Jesus said, someone deliberately. I don't know if you underline in your Bible, but I do, and this, this is underlined in my Bible. Someone deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out from me. She came with intention. She wasn't allowed to be, she wasn't uh, going to allow herself to be classified as her, her 12 years of her past life. She was no longer willing to, sat, to settle for, this is who I am. This is how it will always be. This is where I live. This is my address. This is my plight. This is, no, she wasn't, she wasn't willing to say that one more day of her life. And whether she had to crawl on bended knees, whether she had to get dirty and bump into, I, I'm sure she probably pushed some people down. And you may look down on, that, on her for that, but I believe that she was ready in this moment to say no more. Her faith had produced something in her that was larger than her own self. And that's beautiful. But it says in verse 47, when the woman realized that she could stay hidden no longer, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. And this line here just stuck out to me. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been healed immediately. 
the shameful secret was out in the open. There was no more hiding the fact that this was her condition. But she prefaced, or she, 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 she foreshadowed it with this, that whenever she touched Jesus, she knew that she would be immediately healed. This was her act of worship before the king. She bowed before him and said, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I'm thankful for you. Jesus, I knew that you could do what I knew that you could do. Her faith, how badly do you want it? How badly do you want it? I don't know about you, man, but I want it. I want it. I want more of Jesus. I want more of what he can do. Sweet Holy Spirit, use me. So, she worships Jesus. She has this impromptu worship service at Jesus' feet. And she says to the crowd, this is where I was, this is who I was, and this is where I am now. And the next line, I love this. I love this. Verse 48, it says, daughter. 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 There's a difference. Thank you, Lord. There's a difference. There's a difference between being identified as one of the crowd and being called daughter. There's a difference between, between being just one in a, in a hundred and being called daughter. Daughter, he said to you, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Complete contrast to how she lived before. There was no peace. Being in the family of God, being called, in, being called one with Christ. In Galatians 3.26, it says this, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That every single one of us that has faith in Jesus becomes his child. In that moment when she touched his garment, she knew that she could be healed. She knew that, that, that healing was hers. She had faith. And in that moment, she went from being just another person in the crowd to being the daughter of God. To being the daughter of Jesus. I don't know about you, but that speaks volumes for life. Once, I was just considered another person. But now I have purpose. Before I had a destination, but that destination was paved with my own ways, my own thoughts, my own actions, my own heartbeat. But because I, I, I called upon Jesus, because I had faith to believe that Jesus would save me, he come in and he said, son, here's the new path. And every day that I wake up and I Thank Jesus for my life, and I give him the, the control over where I'm going. He says that the, the steps of the righteous are, are ordained by the Lord. He leads me where I'm supposed to go, and I will follow him wherever that, 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 that path takes me. Do you, do you believe? Do you believe? What are you doing to stretch your faith? How are you... How are you moving into that place where you know that you know that you know that Jesus is who he says he is? And how badly do you want it? How badly do you truly want your family to be saved? How badly do you truly want your coworkers to know about Jesus? How badly do you want your church to grow? How badly do you want to see God's, uh, the, the, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit poured out upon all flesh? How badly do you want those things? Because if you want them with every fiber of your being, with your full heart and your full knowledge and your full self, then you're going to be doing something to produce that faith in the people around you. You're going to be giving them uh, encouragement to build confidence. One thing that, that, that the church in America lacks today is confidence. We lack the confidence to know that the same Jesus that parted the waters, the same Jesus that rose from the grave, the same Jesus that, 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 that can take uh, something that's so sinful and dark and pull all of that out of it and make it as white as snow is the same Jesus that operates in our world today. We refuse to take the responsibility upon ourselves. We look at life and we say these words, there's someone more qualified. There's someone else that can do this. There's someone else that's better at this than, than I am. There's someone else that, 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 that could be doing this. When all the while Jesus is saying, I don't want them, I want you. And you're not hearing his voice saying to you, you're special to me and I want to use you for something great. And you're allowing the blessing to be taken from you. Do you believe that this morning? You're allowing it. And we do, we allow, we allow the blessing to, to, to be robbed from us because we have fear. We're afraid 
of what people will say. We're afraid of how, how people will view us, how people will, 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 will what, what's the report they're going to give to uh, your, your boss or your friend? What, what's the report? But we just read about a woman who spent 12 years in the most pain that she could possibly be in, in the most torment and the shame, and, and, and Satan had had her bound in something that, that was not hers to carry to begin with. And all it took was one encounter with Jesus, and no longer was she ashamed of it, but she told everybody, this is what I used to be, and here's who I am now, that I'm saved, that Jesus, and Jesus called her daughter, amen? But through Christ... And through our faith in him, we are his children. I'm thankful to be a son of, of, of the, the, the living God this morning. And I pray that you're thankful to be a son or a daughter of the living God this morning. But we need confidence to grow. We need confidence to be, to be who we're supposed to be in God. But it says here in verse 49, while he was still speaking to her, a messenger arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. And he told him, your daughter is dead. And my Bible has these, these three words, there's no use troubling the teacher now. Have you ever been in that place where you've said to yourself, there's no need for me to trouble God with my problems? There's, there's, there's no need for me to bother God with this. You know, it's just my cross. It's, it's the thorn that I just am going to have to, you know, bear. You know, everybody has that one thing, right, that they just got to carry around. And there's just no way that Jesus, you know, I just, I don't want to bother him, you know. The, stop thinking like that. We're not bothering Jesus. Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly, right? Why are we allowing the enemy to cause us to stay in these places where we're like, I'll just live in torment. Eh, eh, I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We say these words, but do we truly apply them to ourselves? Do we truly believe them? Because the, the report that there's no use is useless. Because as long as there's breath in you there, and you have God in you, there is a hope that passes anything that you could ever think of or hope for in this world. There's a peace that will, will come over you. And, and, and these men come and said uh, to Jairus that, you know, there's no use to trouble Jesus now. Your daughter, she's gone. She's dead. Game over. End of story. Cut him loose. Let him go. But here's the thing. In verse 50, it says, but when Jesus heard what had happened, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Here's, here's what Jesus wants you to know this morning, that fear will keep you from where you're supposed to be. Fear will destroy everything that God builds in you. And fear will be the thing that they write upon your gravestone, that this so-and-so was afraid to live. So-and-so was afraid to move. So-and-so was afraid to be who God called them to be. We have an adversary. His name's the devil, and he's here to destroy us. And the way that he does it is through this thing called fear. And he, he lines up the, 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 the opposition against us, and he puts things in our way that will cause us to sink back in fear. And, and, and I believe that Jesus said that I didn't give you a spirit of fear but of power, love, and of a sound mind. These are, this is not who you're supposed to be. Fear is not your address. Fear is not where you're supposed to live. That if you're afraid this morning to do something, if you're afraid to step out in faith, if you're afraid to sow that seed, if you're afraid to make that relationship, if you're afraid to ask for that promotion or go to that new job, if you're afraid of these things, then it's you don't have faith in Jesus. And you've allowed the enemy to, 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 to transport your faith out of you, to extract it out of you, and to replace it with something called fear. <sighs> Fear's face enemy. But in 1 John 4, 18, it says that perfect love casts out fear, though. Perfect love. The love of a father, right? That's perfect love. The perfect love that says you were unidentifiable, but now you are a daughter. You are a son. That love, that kind of love that says, yes, I know that you've struggled, but healing is yours. That love that, 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 that casts out the, the idea that I have to suffer for the rest of my life because I live on planet Earth. That this is, this is the enemy's domain, and we're going to have troubles and trials. And I believe that we will have troubles and trials, but I don't believe that we need to give them as much power as we give them. 
I don't think we need to live in the idea that, that oh, troubles and trials are just going to take, they're, I'm going to have stubbed toes and busted knees. No, absolutely not. That I can overcome any obstacle because of who I serve. Because I have faith that Jesus said that he'll never leave me or forsake me, but it will be with me always until the end. I believe that about myself, and I know that the confidence that I have in who God is in my life and the confidence that he's placed in me to be who I'm supposed to be will help me to overcome those things so that the next time the enemy throws that junk in my face, I'm going to just bam! I'm going to blast him in his mouth and I'm going to say, in Jesus' name, get behind me and I'm going to move forward into the, into the life that God wants me to have. I think our faith needs to be stronger than our fear and our, and our faith needs to be the thing that catapults us into that new season of growth and that new season of life. Your faith is the thing that's going to get you to the other side of the lake, the other side of the river. Your faith is the thing that's going to help you to see that prayer that you've been praying for the past 10, 20, 30, 40 years come to fruition. It's the thing that's going to help you to know that Jesus has your back regardless of what you may have heard from other people or what the world may have told you. Shut Shut up, world. I'm tired of listening to you. You have no control over me. In the name of Jesus, get behind me. Amen. Perfect love casts out fear. Maybe you need a little bit of perfect love in your life. Maybe you need to fall back in love with Jesus. Maybe you need to stop coming to church and be the church. Maybe, maybe you need to stop living like your neighbor because your neighbor's not that good, and you need to start living like you're Jesus. Maybe you need to start helping your neighbor to live like Jesus. Maybe you need to be the picture that Jesus wants, your, wants the people in your life to see and stop being that Christian that's up one day and down the next and up one day and down the next. And everyone looks at you, and they're like, schizophrenia. <laughs> Jesus didn't come to give you that. He came to give you life. He came to lift you up. He come to use you for a special purpose, for a special reason. There are people that you come in contact with every day that need to see your faith. They need to know who Jesus is. They need to know what's possible with Jesus. Your faith is that thing that will catapult them into knowing what's possible with Jesus. I could never do this without Jesus. I'm telling you this straight up. I could never stand before you. Thank you, Lord, that you've blessed me with the opportunity that you've given me a, a, a word to speak. But I could never do this without Jesus. And the moment that I try to do it without Jesus, I want someone to just knock me down. I'm, take me out of this thing. Because the moment that we try to do it in ourselves, we mess it up. Our faith has to produce in us what Jesus wants us to, to, to be giving to other people. It's a breakthrough moment. That when we call upon the name of Jesus, we shall be saved. That there's nothing that is bigger than Jesus. There's no circumstance. There's no problem that's bigger than Jesus. Let's, let's see how the story ends. But when Jesus heard what had happened, verse 50, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith. Say that to your neighbor. Just have faith faith and she will be healed so verse 51 says when they arrived at the house jesus wouldn't let anyone go in with him except peter john james and the little girl's father and mother the house was filled with people weeping and wailing but he said who said jesus said right stop the weeping my bible has an exclamation mark so it's probably like stop the weeping uh, she isn't dead. She's only sleeping. But the crowd, right? But the crowd laughed at him because they all knew she had died. Don't, you, don't jump me, man. They all knew she had died. Why do you think Jesus didn't invite anybody else into the house? Because he don't need more people in there saying, she already dead. She's already gone. We, we saw with our own eyes. We... we Tag the toe, cover her with the sheet, put her in the ground, dig the hole. No, but the crowd laughed at him. The crowd said, nope, she's gone. You can't do nothing, Jesus. Sorry. Uh, you, you know, 
The same Jesus that they were excited to see, the same Jesus they had heard perform miracle after miracle after miracle, the same Jesus that, 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 that did never hold back his glory from people when they needed healing in their body, they say to him, but she's already dead. Verse 54, then Jesus took her by her hand and said in a loud voice. <laughs> Think about that. He said to her in a loud voice. There's that exclamation mark again. Can you, have you ever startled somebody? Huh? Have you ever, Candy, you ever startled somebody? <laughs> I like to scare people. And, you know, so it's like, you know, Jesus grabbed her by the hand and he said, my child, get up. Right? Why, why, do you, why do you think he said with a loud voice? Sometimes Jesus' voice will be so loud that he has no option but to silence the doubters that are in your life. His voice will resound in your life through your faith. Jesus didn't invite other naysayers into the house. He invited his three and the parents. Why is that? So that they could be witness to what was about to happen. The, the, his three had already seen miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. They knew that when Jesus walked into this house, whether this girl was dead, uh, dismembered, whatever was going on with this girl, that she was going to be made well. He could have put her head back on. This is Jesus we're talking about. They knew that, right? Mom and dad had been given a report, and Jesus had encouraged them to not be afraid just to have faith. This was an opportunity for them to exercise their faith, to say, yes, they may have said that she's dead, but Jesus can do awesome things, right? So when he walks in the house, they're like, no, she's dead, she's gone, right? No, absolutely not. Jesus spoke louder than the circumstance that was around him, and your faith will produce in you. Why is that? Because Jesus had faith in who he was. He was confident to know that he was God in flesh, that everything that his father could do, he could do too. And let me tell you this, when he died and when he ascended, he gave us this commission. He said, go into the world and preach the gospel. Do greater things than I've ever done on earth before. And he knew that you had it in you. And if you are confident in who God is in you, then you have the ability and the opportunity to put your hands on somebody and see him recover. You have, if you have faith... Do you have faith? If you have faith, you can lay your hands on the sick and see them recover. You can say to yourself, the flu ain't going to touch me. You can say to yourself, it doesn't matter what the world's got. I'm not getting it. I'm above that influence. That's where faith takes you. But Jesus was confident in who he was. That's why he spoke in a loud voice. There was no, girl, if you can get up. I really need you to get up. <laughs> these, these people need to see something. No, 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 no. Jesus spoke with a loud voice. My child, get up. It's like you parents that once you really get to that point where it's like there's no more option and you use that middle name, you know, you throw it out there. You're like, I, I'm going to count to 10. <laughs> Authoritative, right? That's having confidence in the faith. And that's, that's putting confidence into your faith. That's knowing. That's knowing what's on the inside of you. The Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. That's 1 John 3 8. The Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came so that we could have victory in our lives. He comes so that we could have breakthrough in our lives. Jared, if you want to come, He come so that we could have deliverance in our lives, so that everything that we have in our hands, everything that God's placed in us, can be used for the betterment, for the glory of God. He come to destroy fear. He come to destroy the thoughts that the enemy puts into our minds that tells us that we're not good enough. He come to destroy those things. He didn't just come to, to put them away for another time. He come to destroy them. I don't know what your dictionary says, but mine says that when you destroy something, you, you obliterate it. You disintegrate it. It's gone. Little pieces. You can't put it back together. It's destroyed. It's done. Jesus come to destroy the works of the devil. We need to start speaking that over our lives. 
that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of Jesus, that he come so that we could have life and life more abundantly, that uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing the good news about Christ, that we can have the faith that will move a mountain, that we can say to it, move from here to there and it will move, that we can say to our family members, I know you don't want to hear about Jesus, but let me just tell you anyways how much I love him, how much he's changed my life. Better yet, take a look at my life. Does it look different? Because your life will be the biggest testimony that you ever have. Don't waste your life. Faith is the thing that will separate you in this new season. I believe the Covenant Church is heading into a place that needs more faith in God. We need to have more faith in each other. We need to help each other, lift each other, grow each other. I see potential all over this room. I'm looking at you. I see potential in each and every one of these seats. I see some individuals that are scared to death to do anything. I believe that God has placed talents in you. I believe God's placed abilities in you, and he didn't do that by accident. That every person has something that they could be doing in Covenant Church. I'm gonna make it personal because this is my house. This, this, is, this is the place I call home. This is my house. God has given it to me. Thank you, Lord, for that. But there's something that each and every one of you in these seats needs to be doing for, this, for the kingdom of God. I didn't, I didn't expect to get an abundance of uh, applause on that. Because when you start mentioning things like that, it means that you have to do something. There you go. No, no. Preach it with me. That's good. Faith without works is dead. If you're not putting it into action, it's not doing you any good. You have the abilities. You have the talent. You have the God within you. What more are you waiting for? 